Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. Here we grow again. It's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Well, Stacy, we've had uh, folks reach out to us and say, how about giving a little bit of encouragement to beginning gardeners? I think that's a great idea. You know, I agree because it's hard to find out where to start. Yeah. When, you, when you want a garden. Like, how do you support that journey? Where where do you get started? And if I had a dime for every time I'm out and about and people will run into me, first thing they do is vigorously shake my hand. And they say, that the next words out of their mouth are, I have a brown thumb. Everything I touch dies. And I'm like, that's a piece of information I would have liked before you shook my hand. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think when people meet you, the first thing that they say is, wait, 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 I've got a great pun I've been waiting to share with you. <laughs> that too, no question about it. That too. Well, you know, a lot of beginning gardeners start out with house plants, yeah. uh, a couple of house plants. And that's a good idea. As a matter of fact, I often recommend to people that kids get a house plant before they get a pet because it teaches them care and nurturing of, of another living thing. That's a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So I like that idea. And then, of course, tomatoes, peppers, put a few green beans in the ground. Uh, those are the plants that will, you know, get you started. And if you have a little success before you know it, uh, you're thinking hydrangeas and gardenias and kohlrabi and all that kind of stuff. You're off to the races. I mean, I really think that is how it works. You know, mm -hmm. all of us uh, had some sort of entry point into gardening. Yes. You know, whether that was houseplants or we wanted to grow tomatoes or we wanted to grow some basil for pesto. And once you have found that success and that satisfaction with that entry point, then you start to wonder what's next. What's after this? What's after that? And then next thing you know, you don't have any lawn left and you're living in a flower paradise. <laughs> you're right, Stacey. I, I can't, I couldn't have expressed that any better. And, you know, I guess to start for the beginning gardeners, I would say act like a realtor or you're buying a home. Location, location, location. There's a reason there's shade plants, sun plants, size of plants. Uh, so make sure to, uh, to tune in on that. But often the advice that I'll give to beginning gardeners is to take a look at it like golf. You know, with golf, when you start golf, and I'm, I'm not a good golfer. When I'm out there, I take a lot of turf samples. I spend a lot of time in the <laughs> woods. So don't take golfing advice from me. But, uh, you know, I think that when you're taught golf, being taught the fundamentals is important. And uh, lessons and learning are a part of golf and also for gardeners. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. We learn from our mistakes I think it was uh, President Theodore Roosevelt who said, uh, if you could kick the person in the pants responsible for most of your trouble, you won't sit for a month. <laughs> That's so true. Right? So yeah. don't, don't be afraid to make some mistakes. You know, I agree. My uh, take on beginning gardeners is actually somewhat similar to yours because it also involves a hobby and that's cooking. I think, you know, everyone can really relate to cooking because even if they don't golf, everyone cooks a little bit. I Love mean, you've got to gotta, gotta make something and put something <laughs> on the table. And, it, you know, a lot of people now are really into cooking and, and um, they have... I think a lot of people have given themselves a very forgiving attitude towards their mistakes that they've made as they've learned to become better cooks. And it's just like that in gardening. You know, when you learn to cook, you are adapting recipes for your own stove, for your own equipment, for the surroundings and everything that you actually have. And gardening is very simple, si similar yeah. in that, you know, you have all these plants are on the shelf and they all have the same instruction manual. But once you get them home, it's up to you to kind of feel out what your soil is like, what your conditions are like, and do the best you can to match what's recommended for that plant and then observe and watch and learn from that. And I think if people took a similar attitude towards their journey in cooking to gardening, they'd be a lot happier and a lot more forgiving of themselves. No, I agree. Absolutely. And you have to have patience with yourself and you have to be forgiving. And you mentioned an important thing there, the soil or the dirt. Keep your head down on putts or keep your head down when you're golfing the same applies to gardening we've got to start with the soil first uh stacy and if we're able to uh, prepare the soil properly it's going to significantly increase our success level 
Yeah, and if you don't want to prepare the soil properly, well, then you just need to pick plants that are going to grow <laughs> in that soil. And, you know, we're so lucky because, you know, years ago, if you wanted to get started gardening, you'd have to invest in probably four or five big heavy books, yep. um, uh, you know, or get them from the library. And that would be your main go-to. Or maybe you'd join a garden club and, and meet a few other like-minded people in the area. But now with the internet, there's so many easy ways to find, you know, things, find what other people have dealt with when they've struggled with similar problems and, and take that advice. But really what you need to do is to just, um, it's not a, a game of absolutes. You know, it's a, it's a, a game of nuance and learning all of that is part of the joy, I think, of gardening is, oh, yeah. is all of those little things that you learn on the way and you are going to kill plants. And I think a lot of people, when I'm sure you've heard this too, Rick, when they find out you're a professional horticulturist, they're like, oh, I'll bet you never kill a plant. And you're like, I <laughs> kill probably a good 10 to 15 plants a year. Uh, not on purpose, but because, you know, I think, oh, this is really cool and I want it to be here. And then I learn how it grows and I learn what I did wrong. So, um, you know, the more experienced you get in gardening, the more uh, willing I think you are to, I wouldn't say fail because you never fail when you kill a plant. No. You've learned something. No, exactly. Absolutely. You got to have fun. Don't lose your temper. Again, it's just like golf. Don't throw that golf club into the woods. Okay. It's fresh air. It's exercise for beginning gardeners out there. I recommend for outdoor plants, make sure you're out there gardening in the fall. Fall is the perfect time to plant. You'll have great success. The weather is beautiful. Also weed control. Weed control is best in the fall, not spring. And so for beginning gardeners, I think, um, you know, again, like golf, use the forward tee, the one that's uh, furthest up to start, because that's going to help you out. Don't be afraid to do that. And, uh, you know, make sure that you uh, pace yourself, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. For example, if you go crazy in spring and you're planting all kinds of stuff, and uh, this is going to be beautiful. You know what comes next? Summer, heat, weeds. And I don't want to see you get discouraged. So bite-sized pieces. Yeah, okay, Rick. But that said, I've been gardening for like 30 years, and I still bite off more than I can <laughs> chew every ding-dang season. Um, because, yeah, in spring, you're so enthusiastic, and you can't, con you know, you're like, oh, well, if I don't get this plant right now, it's going to sell out, or I'm not going to have another chance to get it. So yeah. I do have to say, if you find yourself unable to take bite-sized pieces, you're in good company. You just, again, have to have that forgiving attitude and learn from it. I haven't learned from it in 30 years years, but I still try. Well, I tell you what, I guess we, I, uh, the comparison I can make is, you know, I like to spend time at the gym and in January and February, right after new year's day, the gym is packed. Oh yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of people on the exer exercise machines that I call phonies. Now what I mean by phony is P H O N E ah. phonies. They're sitting on the machines looking at their cell phones. Well, you're not going to get any exercise that way. And then by March they're gone. So again, bite sized pieces don't bite off more than you can chew. Now plants for beginning gardeners. I'll tell you one right off the bat daylilies. I would recommend because I don't think you can make a mistake with a daylily Unless you have deer. <laughs> <laughs> in which case you're in a world hurt. So aside <laughs> from deer, daylilies are a great first choice. And if you don't have the sun that daylilies need, then hosta, I think, is a really nice um, you know, component to that for people mm -hmm. who have a lot of shade, but also similarly uh, beloved by deer. So neither of those are a great choice if you have deer. Um, what would be a good choice for a beginning gardener who has a lot of deer? I'm allium. Sure. Oh, allium, yeah. That's Easy a to great grow. One. And when you say allium, it's important to know that alliums, a lot of familiar alliums are bulbs that would be planted in fall, but other alliums like serendipity, millennium, those yep. are perennials that you can get Favorites. in your garden center and they are such wonderful plants um, and the deer never touch them and they look absolutely stunning for weeks. Exactly. exactly. Hard to go wrong with And plus you can cut the flowers and enjoy them indoors. Yeah, so you can kind of enjoy it every which way. I think what we'll do is we'll put a list on the website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And yes, it's going to have some of my favorites. As a matter of fact, there is a flowering shrub that every 
beginning gardener should try. And I'm not going to steal your thunder, Stacy. That's coming up in Plants on Trial. I agree with you 100%, so stay tuned for that. But, uh, you know, potentillas, daffodils, sedums, there's a variety of plants that are relatively easy that I think you're going to have success with. And again, we'll put that list uh, on the website. So Plants on Trial is coming up next. And uh, after that, we're going to get into the mailbag today. That's going to be very interesting. And then uh, in branching news, I'm going to be weeding by example, introduce you to a new weed that you should be, not a new weed, it's been around a long time, a weed (laughs) that you should look for in your garden at this time of the year. You're tuned in to the Gardening Simplified Show. We'll be right back. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. I'm Stacey Hervilla, and I'm here with Rick Weiss, and it's the time of the show where we put a plant on trial, which is to say we're going to talk about one of the Proving Manor's Color Choice shrubs, and you get to decide if you're going to add it to your yard. But before we do, I do want to just add one thing to our conversation about beginning gardeners. Sure. And towards the end there, we were recommending some different plants for beginning gardeners. And I, I think we missed out a really important point for beginning gardeners, and that is that you need to plant what you love. You know, we can sit here and give you advice all day on, hey, this is a really good indestructible plant and you can't do anything wrong to it. But I think for a lot of people, what really makes gardening stick for them is going to the garden center and finding something that they just absolutely love, whether it's the the way the plant actually looks in the pot at that very moment or what its promise is on the tag, the picture of what its flowers are going to look like. And when you have that moment of just falling in love with a plant and being so excited to see what it's going to do in your garden, like I remember that from, you know, when I was a teenager and getting into gardening, that to me is is really the key. And yeah, we can give you this this kind of advice and, and you'll find probably as you look at plant tags in the garden center that a lot of plants don't necessarily need a lot of special care or fussiness. Most stuff at the garden center is not, you know, they're not trying to trick you. They want you to come back. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Bravo. You know, I couldn't have said it better. And there's nothing more fun than going to a garden center and buying impulsively. It may be a little hard on your wallet, but it is fun. And then the next step is you find yourself wandering around your yard with a plant in one hand, a shovel in the other trying to f- find a place to put it. But right. that's just plain fun. That is just plain fun, unless, of course, you've been doing that all day, and then you're just like, ah, forget it. I'm putting it here and calling it a day, and I have been there. But in any case, all of that is to say, let yourself fall in love, because that is, as with any hobby or any practice in life, really the key to uh, to the lifelong journey. You but let's get to the plant on trial, which is Little Lime Panicle Hydrangea. Love that plant. It is one of our most popular choices. It is essentially a dwarf version of our most popular plant, which is limelight hydrangea. Uh, And, you know, I picked this. Obviously, we're talking about beginning gardeners. And if, if people ask me, like, hey, what's one plant that I should try as a beginning gardener? I've never gardened anything. I kill everything I try to grow. What would you recommend to me? I always say panicle hydrangeas. And it's not just because they are quite easy to grow. They are. But it's also because the uh, reward that you get for planting one, how much display they put on, how beautiful they are, how long lasting their flowers are, is so worth that effort of planting and caring for it. And it doesn't require a lot of care, but it's just to me that that reward that you get out of it is is almost There's very few other plants that compare. I agree with you, uh, Stacey. And for folks keeping score at home, so that would be a panicle hydrangea. And, you know, people would say, well, for a beginner, hydrangeas, I struggle with hydrangeas, but a panicle hydrangea would be a great choice. Yeah, you know, that's a great point because a lot of people do know, have sort of some general feeling of like, oh, hydrangeas, whoa, wait a minute, hydrangeas are tricky. What are you trying to do to me? And it's not like that. Panicle hydrangeas are... Far and away, the easiest of all hydrangeas to grow. They're the most sun tolerant. They're the most drought tolerant. Whether or not you prune them, they'll still flower. And uh, like I said, they just look incredible. And their flowers last for, 
you know, on, on average, three months, possibly longer, mm-hmm. depending on the variety and your climate. So I like this plant. I like little lime especially. It is a compact version of limelight. So whereas limelight is getting to be like six to eight feet tall, little lime is only going to land in about the three to five foot range. Okay. So this is especially nice, again, if you're a beginning gardener and you're thinking, whoa, six to eight feet, that's a lot of plant. I don't know if I'm going to be able to accommodate that or, you know, it's hard to sort of understand and gauge what that actually means and what that actually looks like in a landscape. Whereas little lime, as a dwarf version at three to five feet, it's a lot easier to say, hey, I have three feet square here. This is a perfect spot for a little lime panicle hydrangea. And a lot of people worry about hardiness, Stacy. And uh, we have viewers and listeners uh, in the North Country, even into Canada. And this plant is uh, is really hardy. Yes, that's another great reason to recommend little lime panicle hydrangea for beginning gardeners because panicle hydrangeas are extremely cold tolerant. They will thrive even in USDA zone three, which is that's cold. extremely far north. In fact, I, there's very few areas in the actual U.S. that are USDA Zone 3, aside from maybe Alaska. Uh, you have to go pretty far, even up into Canada, to actually get into Zone 3. So it's really including the majority of people in North America. Um, and it's quite heat tolerant. So Little Lime is heat tolerant through about USDA Zone 8, which is like roughly... Atlanta yeah. and a little bit further south. So, you know, I would say easily a good 80% of uh, North America, uh, U.S. and Canada can easily grow a panicle hydrangea. Well, it can get cold here in West Michigan. And Stacy, this plant was developed right here in West Michigan, wasn't it? It was indeed. You know, because limelight, we had so much success with limelight, people loved it instantly. Panicle hydrangeas have been planted in gardens for centuries. Uh, and limelight really was the first sort of innovative or revolutionary panicle hydrangea because it had these beautiful green blooms. It was fast growing. Growers could get it to market quickly. And we've talked about this a bit that, you know, if a plant is really hard for growers to produce, no matter how beautiful it is, it doesn't really stand a chance out there. So it kind of had everything aligned for it to be really successful. And it was an instant hit when we released it here in the U S and, but people again, don't always have space for that full size limelight. So we wanted a dwarf limelight for some time. And so my boss, Tim Wood, spent the time to develop a dwarf limelight by crossing limelight with known smaller varieties of panicle hydrangea. Uh, and eventually, over many, many years of selecting and crossing and, and back crossing, uh, we were able to introduce little lime. And it is it's such a beautiful plant. It's just, it's a nice little mound of green flowers. And the flowers are proportional to the plant, which is another mm-hmm. thing I really love about little lime is so the, you know, limelight at six to eight feet, big plant, big flowers. Little lime is a smaller plant and the flowers are proportioned to the size. So it just is very pleasing to the eye. Another thing I love about it in terms of those smaller in scale flowers is that they're perfect for cut flowers. The limelight flowers are huge. And so if you like cut flowers or dried flowers, sometimes they're too big. Yes. You don't have a vase big enough or they're too top heavy in, in, you know, knocking over your vase. I think little lime is the perfect plant for enjoying indoors as well as outdoors. Yeah. And coming up in a few weeks, we will talk about cutting flower gardens. And uh, this is one that you would certainly want to have as part of a cutting flower garden. Stacy, folks also in the heat of summer worry about wilt or wilting on hydrangeas. What's the story on little lime and the soil condition. Right. So um, going back to what's good for what's easy and successful for beginning Mm -hmm. gardeners, I'm going to tell you the one way to kill little lime hydrangea or any panicle hydrangea for that matter is poor drainage. So soil that is soggy or wet for any period of time. And I'm going to get to the wilting part in just a second. So just bear with me here. I have over the years that I have been answering questions for gardeners here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, heard from so many people who got a panicle hydrangea, whether it was little lime or quick fire or any of the number of panicle hydrangeas we offer and said, Oh, I'm so excited to grow this. I am going to make the most ideal, perfect home for it in my yard. I'm going to dig a hole. I'm going to dump this big bag of compost or fresh potting soil into the hole. And then I'm going to tuck that 
that little lime right in there, and it's just going to have a nice, soft, fluffy bed. And that is the exact opposite mm -hmm. of what you should do when you're planting a panicle hydrangea because what that does is cause something called the bathtub effect. And so basically, in a nutshell, that soft, fluffy soil, whether it's compost or topsoil or uh, potting mix that you added, holds a ton of water. The surrounding soil does not hold nearly as much water. Yes. So when you're watering your plant or it rains, a ton of water will infiltrate into that soft, fluffy soil that you added, but the surrounding soil can't hold it uh, as it drains out. So what happens is that water just sits yes. in that soft, fluffy soil right around the roots of your new hydrangea. And I have to tell you, I've seen more people kill or severely set back their panicle hydrangeas doing this very well-intentioned, I will admit, mm -hmm. thing. So um, by all means, avoid poorly drained soil. Now, overall, these are very easy plants to grow. I'm going to have everything in the show notes because I don't have time to get into all of it. Not that it's complex. And of course, everything is on the tag if you get it. But, you know, I do want to set all of these people who maybe are gardening for the first time, set them up for success. So just go to gardening simplified on air.com. We'll put everything you need to know to be successful with little lime hydrangea. You can also see pictures because of course, got to put a plan on trial to see, got to see pictures to make sure yes. you want to add it to your, to your garden. Although I have to say, I think little lime is one of the most beautiful and versatile looking plants, whatever the style of your home from a really modern mid-century looking house to something very traditional to everything in between. It looks great. Pretty yeah. much everywhere you grow. And uh, the beautiful factor here also involved is that uh, the flowers will change color as we head towards fall. Right. So you're getting a, a dynamic display, not just one kind of steady thing. And that's another great thing about gardening is that it changes through the season and you're living your journey right alongside it. I love that. And for beginning gardeners, make sure you listen to what Stacy just said, because that is a key element. Don't dig a hole and throw amendments in it. Don't Mix it. amendments with the existing parent soil. A general rule of green thumb I have is 50-50. Mix it in. You're going to be more successful. That yes. Way. And your plant will be successful too. So we've got to take a little bit of a break right now, but do stay tuned because when we come back, we're going to be answering your gardening questions. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Whether you are a beginning gardener or have been gardening for years, we welcome you back. Now, this is the time where we answer people's questions, and I'm sure a question on everyone's mind right now is, who won Shrub Madness? Oh, yeah. Yay. And I can tell you what, I predicted the winner right. What do I get? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Uh, it's, you know, 640,000 votes or something. I yes. Think? Almost a quarter, almost three quarters of a million votes wow. uh, during this year's Shrub Madness. So Shrub Madness is the Proven Winners Color Choice uh, Plant Competition, where the shrubs compete against one another and your popular vote determines the winner. And this year's winner was Let's Dance Skyview Hydrangea. And I can see why. And talking about beginning gardeners, Stacy, this is a rebloomer. It right? is. Oh, absolutely. No, yeah. All of our hydrangeas pretty much are reblooming. So that means that they bloom on old and new wood. Mm -hmm. You get a longer display. And, you know, it's hard to beat even when 64 other shrubs or 63 other shrubs are in the competition. It's just hard to beat a blue hydrangea. People love them. So congratulations to Let's Dance Skyview. I can't say it was an upset or a surprise, really, but we are happy that it won. And you will certainly find Let's Dance Skyview Reblooming Hydrangea at your local garden center this spring. So what do we got in the mailbag, Rick? Well, Julie writes to us about her purple pillar, Rose of Sharon. Love that plant. Uh, she says, I planted three of these in the spring of 2020. Doing great, except that in the summer of 2021, again, 2022, they dropped probably 100 buds on the ground throughout the season. Unopened flowers, not the seed pods. What a bummer. I asked my local nursery. They suggested it was probably a mite. I looked closely and I thought... I don't see any white moving specks. What's going on here? What's the reason? Do I need spring fertilizing? I've attached pictures. Yes. And so thank you so much for sending that picture, Julie. That is always very helpful because a lot of times when people do write to us about uh, their hibiscus or Rose of Sharon, they say, oh, it didn't bloom. And it's just because the, the seed pods do look so much like the flower buds. But I can confirm and, and we'll put Julie's photo and question on the show notes at Gardening Simplified on air com that this is definitely flowers that just didn't open and just fell right to the ground. And not surprisingly, this typically indicates stress. So, you know, 
uh, plants, of course, live to reproduce, and flowers are part of that reproductive cycle, but flowers take a ton of a plant's energy. And so if a plant, for whatever reason, is like, whoa, I'm running out of energy, I'm not feeling so hot, it's just going to say, well, flowers are going to go. Flowers are not essential for my survival in the here and now. Just going to drop them, conserve my resources, and hopefully I will survive to flower another year. Um, is that a good, <laughs> Adriana's it's laughing. True. It's true. Very, <laughs> plants don't talk, but if they did, I, I, oh, that's how talk. their thought process would probably go. <laughs> um, and so when I looked at Julie's picture, I could see that there was some chlorosis on the plant. So um, overall, roses of Sharon are pretty heavy feeders. Uh, they can do okay in most, you know, average conditions, but there can be a lot of other reasons that... Um, you know, that a plant might be a little bit low on nitrogen or, or iron or other nutrients could be a, so- a soil pH issue. So um, I am going to guess that this is some sort of fertility issue just because I did see, you know, a, like an entire branch of very yellowing foliage on there. Um, so I would say definitely plan to fertilize. I recommend for shrubs in general, a rose fertilizer. And you can just apply that now. Um, So I usually recommend starting to fertilize in early spring and continuing that through about late July. Monthly should be more than enough. I think that will help. Um, Now, overall, Roses of Sharon are pretty drought tolerant. They can take some pretty dry periods of soil. Um, So I don't really think, looking at Julie's photo, that the issue was that it was drying out too much, even though it's still kind of a newer plant. Um, So I'm going to just go out on a limb. I don't think it was mites. Go out on a limb. Very good. (laughs) Well, you know, I used to do a live call-in radio show, and we would get a lot of these questions in August and September. Mm. So I think, uh, especially if it's a new plant, uh, I agree, Stacey, fertility. But uh, also, you know, if the plant gets at some point too dry, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as you said, it's a protective mechanism. And it will drop those buds. Well, especially, you know, if, if this uh, purple pillar was just planted in 2020, it's still only, you know, this will be its third year. Plants aren't usually considered established until three years yeah. in the ground. So it, in during that three-year establishment period for a shrub, they do need a little bit of extra TLC. So, Julie, I hope that helps. And if it doesn't, please definitely reach out to us if it happens again this summer. And I can't stress this enough. When you're having plant problems, of course, we can help you now, do the best you can, and we appreciate you taking that photo. But it's always so much easier during the time when we're familiar with the conditions that are happening, what the weather is actually like at that exact moment. So don't hesitate to get back in touch, Julie, and we will get you on the right track. All right. Uh, by the way, in the mailbag, I got to make a comment real quickly here. Our previous show, we talked about the noise of pickleball in neighborhoods and folks commenting that they would prefer pickleball over leaf blowers. And oh. I have to publicly say, I agree uh, 100%. The shovel was a groundbreaking invention, but everyone was blown away by the leaf blower. And so what happens when you cross a rabbit with a leaf blower? You get a hair dryer. Sorry, H-A-R-E. That's right. If I have to spell it out, it's not a good pun. (laughs) Well, uh, God forbid there ever come a day where there's competitive leaf blowing. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So let's, uh, let's, on a serious note here, a question from Pat. Will flowers that are treated with neonicotinoids and then bees use the pollen from these plants truly cause a collapse of a bee colony? Pat saw a post and a picture on Facebook warning people not to purchase these types of treated flowers that can cause harm to a bee colony. Yeah, and this is such a good question, Pat, and I'm glad that you wrote it in. So um, neonicotinoid is a type, uh, it's a group of pesticides, a class of pesticides that is relatively recent in its introduction. And basically what they are is they are a systemic pesticide. And what that means is that you can essentially just water the soil with a neonicotinoid pesticide mixed with water and the plant takes it up and then it's in the plant. So whatever comes along, not whatever insect comes along and chews on it um, will get the result of the pesticide and it will die. And one of the, the questions that Pat asked is why, if these are so harmful to bees, why are people using them? And I think it's important to understand that originally the reason that neonicotinoids became so popular was because they really truly reduced harm to anybody who was applying them. You know, farmers, growers, they don't apply pesticides just for the fun of it. They're expensive. They're time consuming. They do it to really provide a a quality product so that you one that you actually want to buy. And so from a grower perspective or farmer perspective, they were like, hey, this is great. There's no aerosolized, 
you know, particles of the pesticide, sure. safer to apply, no real re-entry time. You didn't have to wait for things to dry. And so that was why they got so popular in the first place. And then when the study found that, you know, a lot of annuals and things that in the garden center had remnants of neonicotinoid pesticides in them, it caused this great big uh, backlash. And the meme that Pat saw is really still a remnant of that time. Now, I can say, you know, Proven Winners phased out the use of neonicotinoids in our starter plants, you know, due to all of this and this information. And so it has become a lot less popular from a production standpoint. You can still buy them in the garden center. So that is something that you should be aware of. They're not outlawed from the shelf. Um, but I have not, and Pat sent the, a picture of the meme that goes around on social media sure. every year. I haven't seen those in probably four years, those tags that said okay. that a plant was treated. So I think that all of the outcry that people have had has really kind of helped the whole industry um, rethink their use of neonicotinoids. And I, I would say that it has decreased substantially. But it's also important to understand that um, neonicotinoids were implicated in colony collapse. But just like our guest, uh, the beekeeper, a few weeks ago said, colony collapse is a, is a whole parcel of causes. It's not just any one thing. It's not just pesticides. So when it comes to you know, conserving honeybees and conserving insects and preserving their health, it takes a total approach uh, to doing the right thing and making sure that they're healthy. Yeah, I agree. I like that word, by the way, passel. <laughs> Add that one to okay. my uh, vocabulary, but you're right. We're talking about varroa mites. Uh, when we talk to our beekeeper, pathogens, virus, those are all part of the issue also with colony collapse disorder. Right. It's it's just, it's not one single cause. So um, all of us could do to reduce our use of pesticides. And I did want to just close uh, this particular question by saying, you know, memes are obviously very popular. Social media lets memes spread like wildfire. But I think, especially if you are a beginning gardener, it's, it's good to think of memes as a, a a topic for research. You know, the story can never be told in some catchy meme that you're sharing on Facebook. There's always way more to it. So I would say in all cases, whatever you're seeing, and I've seen a lot of bad gardening advice going around in memes, whether that's, you know, burying a banana next to your hydrangea in hopes that it will turn blue, which it will not. Remember the one about the diaper and the hanging basket? Yes, oh yes. gosh, yes, I know. I do. Uh, and you know, the, the crazy thing about the diaper and the hanging basket meme was that it will not work. Like, it sounds like, okay, I'm going to put this. That's the bottom line. <laughs> it's not going to work because diapers are made to hold on to moisture, not give it up, as any mother and father, I'm sure, can tell you. And so it's like, okay, fine, the diaper's going to be in your hanging basket. Once you water it, it's going to absorb all that water. It's just going to stay there. It's not going to give it back to the soil. <laughs> not a good way to pamper your plants. <laughs> Amen to that, right? Okay. So anyway, beware of memes, do your research, and if you have any questions, you know, you can always reach us at help at gardening simplified on air dot com. All right, with that, we've got to take a break. And when we come back, we're gonna have branching news. You won't want to miss it. All right, friends, it's time for branching news, not breaking news, branching news, but we're not making this stuff up. Stacy. it's pothole season, and it's the time of year when in social media you'll see some entrepreneurs, as I call them, go out there and plant flowers in potholes to call attention to the problem. By the way, uh, I understand that one of the, one of the, Worst places for potholes is the the Twin Cities area in St. Paul. That's what I've that's what I've heard. Well, I I would guess they have to do quite a bit of plowing and salting. Exactly. So that would make sense. I mean, if driving in winter is better because the potholes are filled with snow, you might be a northerner. So uh, for our folks down south, that's the case. Uh, I love the Seinfeld episode, the episode called "The Pothole." I don't know if you remember I watching. I don't remember that one. No. When George Costanza drops his uh, Phil Rizzuto keychain in a hole in the street, and then a road crew filled it in, and and then he has to use a jackhammer to get it out. Anyhow, great episode. You can probably find it on YouTube, folks, if you want to watch it. Here's the point: research is underway, determining that the uh, weather that we've been getting in winters lately, whether it's Canada or here in the northern states in the U.S., the freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw cycle is really causing more problems for 
potholes. And it does. It's that freeze-thaw cycle. Water gets into the cracks, then it expands. You have traffic. And uh, as Stacy would say, blammo, you have potholes. Uh, but the interesting thing here is that they are looking to substitute an alternative binder called lignin, a plant polymer, and abundant waste product from paper mills into, uh, into asphalt in the future, as opposed to using crude oil uh, products uh, as uh, uh, the binder in oh. asphalt. So I thought that was interesting. That is very cool. You know, the whole freeze-thaw danger, I think gardeners are perhaps second to road crews well-equipped to talk about this because who among us hasn't lost a beloved container, yes. ceramic or clay container that we accidentally left out and that freeze-thaw made it crack and fall apart. So uh, so we know the heartbreak of the freeze-thaw cycle ourselves. You know, we're the same way exactly and we like to stand around leaning on our shovels talking about it, yeah. right? <laughs> hey, this just in, branching breaking news, uh, take me to your weeder the arch nemesis of early spring gardeners, my my pal Harry Bittercress, Bittercress, C R E S S, is uh, all over the place. Now this is that weed that pops up instantly in spring. Has the little white flowers that jettison. It's in the mustard family, so it jettisons these seeds all over the place. But it's a great lesson for beginning gardeners because Harry Bittercress. And some people will forage for it. I guess it's pretty tasty in your salad. But hairy bittercress is one of those what we call winter annuals. So it's there in the fall. You could control it in the fall. In spring, when the snow clears, it's there, but that's when it blooms. People will run to the garden center, get a weed killer, spray it. It will die, and they think, wow, wow, I did the job. No, they didn't do the job. The plant was going to die anyhow, and now you have these seeds all over the place. So familiarize yourself with it. We'll put a picture at the website. But it's my uh, my good buddy, Harry Bittercrest. Yes, and you know, um, we didn't have a word of the day yet. I don't know if you have one planned. Oh, yeah. But um, I would put forth here that Harry Bittercrest uh, exhibits explosive dehiscence. Aha. <laughs> I'm glad you pronounced that because I didn't know how to say dehiscence. I yes. thought it was dehiscence. Uh, explosive dehiscence. That basically means uh, when, when the seeds, seeds go pop. Yep, and explosively. Or it's as Stacy would word. say, blammo. Blammo. <laughs> so the little seed pod, you know, it dries out and it explodes and that's called dehiscence. And so explosive dehiscence. And that's why Harry Bittercress uh, winds up all over the place. But, you know, I have to say, I have seen it popping up here in West Michigan in people's yards. And it's pretty. I think it's very pretty. There are some people who think it's pretty and there's some people who eat it. Yeah. But uh, if it's a weed in your perennial bed, it can drive you crazy, and you just have to familiarize yourself with good old uh, Harry. Yes, well done on the word of the day. Uh, the ballistic dispers dispersal strategy is also known as balacory, B-A-L-L-O-C-H-O-R-Y, and that popping is from the stems called salics. Salics. So we're talking about explosive Dehiscence. Yep. And Salique is S I L I Q U E. It's a very, very sophisticated word, I think. Did you realize gardening is fun? Uh, I, Interesting. I love it. Uh, so do I. <laughs> Dehiscence. All right. Hey, Stacy, this one's for you. Our listeners and viewers already have the gardening hobby, but how about adding knitting? Men's knitting clubs. If you think about it, schoolboys, uh, during World War II, were taught how to knit, and they would knit uh, blankets for the troops. Uh, the members of the Washington, D.C. Men's Knit Club, they spark a degree of fascination when they meet in public places. Uh, but this is kind of a, a craze like gardening, a hobby, and uh, men are picking up on, uh, on knitting. Well, why wouldn't they? No one likes to be bored. And I mean, if, even if you're just going to sit there and watch a movie, why wouldn't you keep your hands busy and do something productive like uh, knitting something? I, oh, I agree. I never sit in front of the TV without a knitting, knitting or crochet project. I had plans to learn how to knit, but it unraveled. So uh, <laughs> that one leave you in stitches. Uh, I knew that was coming. <laughs> We're going to put that story there at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. 
How about a Bugweiser moment? We all need a Bugweiser now and then, and you'll see posts in social media about not cleaning up your yard too soon. Yes. For the pollinators. Now, let's address that a moment, and there's truth to this. Uh, and I'm going to say bumblebees especially are a great uh, example. I was talking to Dr. David Lowenstein from Michigan State University a few weeks ago, and he was saying as far as bumblebees are concerned, yes, you don't want to clean up too soon because uh, they're overwintering in the leaf litter. Yes. So So my solution, and uh, I I did want to talk about this, so I'm glad it came up. So I am, uh, as I think some of our listeners know, my main reason for gardening is insects. I love insects, and seeing insects interact with my plants and flowers is my favorite part of gardening. So I'm always very careful to make sure my my home is as home is as welcoming to them as it is to me. Um, but of course, at this time of year, when all that perennial debris is sitting around, you're kind of like, well, I'm not supposed to throw it away until temperatures are consistently over 55. But a lot of times your perennials start coming out and you don't want to have to try to wend your way around the emerging foliage to get the old stuff out. So what I do is I just pile it up in a tarp. Put it on the side of my garage until it's 55 or over. That gives them plenty of chance for everything to emerge. I don't have to worry about trying to trim through emerging foliage. And then I throw everything away sometime around like mid to late May. Oh, that's really smart. So that's how I handle it. Yeah. Well, you know, as part of this Bugweiser segment, uh, what we do generally is we'll track something called GDD, which Mm -hmm. is growing degree day accumulations. And as the earthworms and the uh, worms and worms. (laughs) I know, it works both ways. I punned and I wasn't even trying. (laughs) GDD, growing degree day accumulation. And that's how we can track also when uh, a variety of these insects are going to uh, emerge. So you're right. Once it warms up, then we're off to the races. Okay, uh, final story here. I loved this one. Shocked witnesses captured photos and videos showing a cow wandering around tennis courts in England this past week. And uh, this cow was trying to get into the clubhouse through automatic doors. It was a 10-month-old cow. It had escaped from a field in England and ended up spending more than 10 hours on a tennis court about uh, a mile away, and uh, this is fantastic. We're going to put the link on the uh, the website. It was a bovine intervention, standing there trying to figure out how to uh, get the automatic doors to uh, to open, Aww. so it, this cow could get into the uh, the clubhouse. <laughs> I'll bet the cow's name was Annette. You know, I'm going to milk this for all it's worth. <laughs> Had reservations around tennis or so. Anyhow, okay, so we'll put that uh, up on the uh, website. Congratulations on Shrub Madness. Thank I think you. that's exciting. It is exciting. And this was our 10th year, I think. Yeah, ten. we've been doing it for 10 years. And we've only had one year where a hydrangea didn't win. <laughs> and it was because we didn't put hydrangeas in the competition because they always won. <laughs> So if you're unhappy with the results of Shrub Madness, all I can tell you is uh, sign up next year and vote because your votes determine the winter and the winner. And if everybody just keeps voting for hydrangeas, can't do anything about it. Well, and all joking aside, the Let's Dance series is fabulous. It is. And Let's Dance Skyview, the winner, is a absolutely lovely plant that you will find again at your garden center uh, this spring. We want to thank Adriana Robinson, our producer and engineer of the Gardening Simplified show. Make sure to visit GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. Thank you, Stacy. It's been a privilege and pleasure to do the show with you. Likewise, Rick, and thank you all for listening. Hope you have a wonderful week ahead. Happy spring. 